Welcome. This is the Ag Engineering Podcast, where we talk tools, tips, and techniques to improve the sustainability of your farm. I am your host, Andy Chamberlain, from the University of Vermont Extension, and this podcast is supported by Northeast SARE, providing grants and education to advance innovation in sustainable agriculture. We're trying to improve the industry by chatting with farmers and getting their input on tools, tips, or techniques that have changed the way they farm for good. Many of these practices affect multiple areas of the farm. Whether it be environmentally, emotionally, physically, or financially, we share the knowledge to promote sustainable agriculture, lifestyle, and business. Thanks for having a listen. Now, let's get started. Today's episode comes to you from Barnet, Vermont, where we meet with Heidi Choate and Evan Perkins of Small Axe Farm. Together, they've got 20 years agricultural experience and 11 years in this business, They are growing on an acre of production, which includes about an eighth of an acre in both high tunnels and caterpillar tunnels. They sell primarily to a retail wholesale markets with 10% going to CSA or custom orders. Their sales this last year was about 115,000 gross, and they utilize about two and a half FTEs. Heidi and Evan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us on. Thanks. So I just set the stage a little bit about your farm, but if you could just describe what you do in one sentence, what would you say? We have a one-acre no-till market garden um, on our off-grid homestead, and that's how we make our living. So you started out homesteading, and you went into farming. Can you explain a little bit about how that decision went and um, how you built up your markets? Well, we, we had always planned to make our living off our land and farm, you know, we hadn't really decided exactly how we were going to do it farming, but that was, you know, it was going to be part of the picture. And even before we bought our land, we, um, Heidi had, um, helped to start a a farm program at the school where she was working. Um, and we started a community garden there and were involved in starting a community garden, but, and then did because we were, knew we wanted a homestead, we just grew a lot of food and we learned how to grow food um, for ourselves first. And then, um, Heidi, you can talk a little bit about what you did for the farm program in terms of production oh, sure. there. Sure. Um, we were learning about gardening and we were really excited about it and um, brought the idea to the school that I was working at, which is a boarding school, as an offering in the fall and the spring to build with the kids and to garden with the kids and sort of teach them how to grow food and that we would grow food for the school kitchen, the school cafeteria, which was really fun. Um, So we did that for quite a few years and we sort of, I was doing that while we were transitioning over to the land. So it was actually a great, a great segue because we had summers um, most, mostly off. And so we could be here building while we were sort of um, figuring all that out. (laughs) And we, you know, we were always, you know, growing a ton of food. So we sold food here and there all along, you know, to neighbors or traded with neighbors and stuff. Um, and I think it was, I think like 2008 was the first year we sold uh, like a CSA share to a neighbor. And um, I think we did two the first year and then I think it kind of stuck. And then we sold some other, quite a bit of other produce right. that year to different stuff. But then the next year we decided, okay, we're ready. We still had added onto our, our little cabin and, and um, it had like enough space for us to live and actually farm in. Um, even though we didn't have any other infrastructure really. Um, we had like a wheelbarrow rake and a five gallon bucket, which is how a lot of farms have started in the past. Um, hopefully they're starting faster these days. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so for the first couple of years, we really just had a wheelbarrow rake and a five gallon bucket and but we made for us on our homesteading income it was a very substantial income for us um from that because the inputs were almost zero you know um but very labor intensive obviously and then yeah and so we decided okay we want to do this farm as like part of our income we lived a really frugal lifestyle i did some work teaching in the outdoors and um, did carpentry work in the winter time and and stuff like that but we still at that point were living homesteading primarily and working part-time off farm. So initially the farm started for that as like another part to replace one of those part-time jobs. Um, and with the knowledge that we were going to grow it eventually. So we, we grew slowly. We've grown steadily at like 15 or 20% a year 
from, you know, maybe whatever, a thousand dollars that first year or something, you know, we just kind of kept on going. Um, and then it was probably about five years ago when we decided that that was when we decided we, well, we want to actually make money at this because money hadn't really been part of our picture before, but we're like, we're getting older. One of us is injured, you know, part of the time, usually, you know, it just seemed like every year something was coming up as we got older and we've worked our bodies pretty hard. And, and then we had a son who, you know, was happily frolicking along, frolicking along with hand-me-down clothes on the homestead. And, and then, but he was getting older and wanted to do stuff that actually cost money at that point. And so we were like, okay, when we want to, to provide that opportunity for him. And so we decided, okay, well, let's see, let's make a go at this. And we already had a pretty decent sized little farm then, but we were probably making like $30,000 a year or something. We were grossing $30,000 a year. And, um, yeah, so we just decided from that point on, well, let's put, let's figure out how to make this more profitable and then make enough money for us to live on and put away stuff for retire, some money for retirement and have the infrastructure we need to age on our farm and still be able to do it. So that was kind of our progression. So we didn't start off saying we're going to be a highly successful one acre market farm. Like that wasn't our really plan in the beginning. We were just kind of, we're all, we're more path people than goal people. And so we were on one path and then, uh, you know, four or five, probably about five years ago, we switched, okay, let's be on this path where we're going to make this farm more profitable. Yeah, it truly evolved. And then somebody gave us an old, one of their old iPhones, which we, we didn't really have any tech out here. And um, instead of calling, you know, 40 people and saying, hey, I've got some extra bok choy. Do you want some tomorrow? We'll deliver it. You know, I could email 40 people in a minute <laughs> and, and, um, that really revolutionized our farm and how we ran the business. And really we had a lot of access to sell every, and which we tend to do. We tend to sell every last thing, um, which is great. Great for us. And I think it's important um, to, to mention that we, we purposely bought land in a really rural place because we're rural people. That's where we wanted to live. Um, just, we like, quiet we like the kind of neighbors we have um you know the long time farmers who live on our hill here like we just like being around those people and part of that community and involved living in a rural place and part of that when we started our farm since we were way up on dirt roads and there wasn't a lot of traffic like we didn't want to have people pick stuff up at the farm um and so we designed our whole business on delivery and we had a few csa shares and other things like that in the beginning and then we also had a custom order business and people would actually call our phone and listen to the message on the phone and they could hear what products we had available and then they would leave a message with okay i want you know three bunches of bok choy and some and a pound of tomatoes and and you know six onions but not too big um, we would get orders like that and then, <laughs> then a lot we, of minutia. yeah, and then we just leave with a car and we would deliver to our CSA customers and, um, and then generally they were on the way to restaurants or, um, or co-ops the, um, that we sold to. You know, I always hear um, people recommending that that farmers, you know, find the perfect land so they can have the perfect farm layout. And I think that is really important. I think, especially living in the state that we live in, um, you know, I think it's also important for people to realize that that we make a living on a steep on a steep hillside. We have a, a profitable farm. We've made our whole living for for our family for many many years. Um, on a steep hillside and um, it allowed us to buy land because it was steep. So I just, that shouldn't be, you know, I, I think people should just consider it, you know, just like it doesn't mean that you can't farm there. Um, it does make a lot of things less efficient and that's just the reality of it. But it's pretty easy to say, oh, buy perfect land. Well, there's not that much flat land in Vermont that's that, um, you know, someone without money can get into if they want to own their own farm. I think there's lease opportunities and things like that, which are good, but it's harder for farmers to age um, with leased land and to have an investment that they can live off of in their old age. So. Yeah. And also, um, you know, buy perfect land next to just outside of a city where you can sell it all. And, and that is great. Um, but we need, we need farms out here too. Um, we don't have, you know, big cities close to us. And, 
yeah, it's hard to, to market sometimes, but we've made it work. And, um, you know, over time we've educated our community and they love our food and, um, yeah, it, it can work. You, uh, kind of are out, out into the sticks a bit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what would you say is the closest, um, typical grocery store that probably a lot of the community would go to? That would be the white market in um, St. Johnsbury, and that's only 20, 20 miles from here, 16 miles from here, I think it is. So it's relatively yeah, f- close. Yeah, from our and land, I think it's actually like 15, but it's 20 minutes to get there. Yeah. It's mostly highway That's well, not time. too bad. Yeah. It's not too bad. It's just a small, small little grocery chain. There's three of them, and they, um, they all three of them buy our produce and sell, and we started off real small. They didn't have a lot of local stuff, not, not too, too much there. And um, we sort of built that relationship up over time, and now they sell quite a quite a bit of our of our produce, and it's been really exciting to work with them and to be part of a small local grocery chain. It's been great for for everybody, I think. And there's also a price chopper in that town as well, so a larger grocery store yep. in St. Johnsbury. Um, and then we sell to a couple of larger co-ops that are a little farther away. You're in almost the northeast kingdom of Vermont, do you find it to be competitive working with these uh, grocery stores to sell your product, or how has that been? Yeah. What do you mean by competitive? Oh, to... Like, are there many other farms trying to sell their stuff locally as well, or are you kind of it out in this neck of the woods? Oh, no. We live in... Uh, our, we live in... I think our... I forget what our town has. Maybe like 1,200 people in it, but we have, you know... Um, we have four organic vegetable farms, three farm stands, two organic you pick strawberry farms in our in our in our little <laughs> town. Yeah. So I th- I th- I've never talked to someone over in Maine. There was only one organic you pick strawberry farm in the state of Maine a few years ago, and we had two in our town. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, this is a great place to live and a great place to farm. And our farming neighbors are, are like all incredible farmers. Like yeah. you walk on any one of their farms and like. They're incredible. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a competitive type mature market. Um, our goal from the beginning was to try to get into these little grocery stores and grow the market there. That's where we think the market is, um, and that's where there's room to grow. Yeah, um, and when we first got here, we had to really find our niche and find where there was room for us because there were some farms here before us. So we tried not to step on too many toes and really, you know, create products um, – that just weren't in the market yet and that's sort of where we started and we've you know yeah that's how we've we've built our business I think yeah I think when we you know we started selling at the Littleton co-op and our first probably 15 products we sold there they weren't getting regularly on a reliable reliably and that's how we got in there it's just not that they had never sold french breakfast radishes before but no one was producing them every week for the whole season and and that was kind of how we found our niche initially and like with the whites markets we went in there for years and a couple times a year they would buy they would buy greens from us but they would never reorder and we'd you know and so it just took years to slowly build that relationship up to for them to realize hey there's a market for this we can make money on it it's not just a novelty product so yeah that's kind of the, the that's kind of how we built a market in a rural area but our, our goal has always been to try to grow the market because you know we have a really small CSA we don't go to farmers market because in both of those areas there's not a lot of room for growth if we grow there we're just taking a share from another farm probably um or if we go to farmer's market this we've got a really great farmer's market in st johnsbury with great vendors and they probably don't need another mixed vegetable vendor that and especially since we kind of focus on more of the high value items we don't want to come up there loaded with all the greens which is probably a lot of the profit for the other farms there at the market yeah that's kind of how we've worked in this rural area um we found our way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think there's room for other farms to find their way too. It's just not going to be straightforward. Yeah. You yeah. Know, it's always going to be like, you got to find an, an, an untapped area, but still 95% of people are buying all their food all the time at the grocery store. So there's a whole market there that um, is untapped as of yet. You mentioned how you grow some crops that um, the other mixed veggie vendors uh, might not. What are, what are your top sellers that you're bringing to these stores? I don't think that's true now. I think in the beginning of our farm, and it wasn't that people weren't growing them, it's just maybe not providing them consistently. But I think now there's there's very little we grow that other farms don't grow. But I um, think we did we did start with the D'Avignon radish, French breakfast radish, and the salad turnip, and the um, 
the Scarlet Queen pink salad turnips and, and just some things that, yeah, weren't consistently there. Yeah, it was more about consistency, heirlooms, not that other farms tomatoes, weren't growing them. Yeah, sure. So, but yeah, we're, our focus was really in the beginning on heirloom tomatoes and and salad greens and radishes and things like that. And that's still like our that's big money makers. Um, mm-hmm. We have pretty diverse, we have a whole line of salad greens. So we, we offer um, a kind of an Asian greens based or Vermont mescaline mix is what we call it. Um, or mix mix as it's known on the farm since <laughs> mescaline means mix in French. So we just call it mix mix, mix, mix. Um, which is pretty versatile and then lettuce and baby kale. So nothing mind blowing, nothing that other farms aren't growing. Um, we were just more about like in the wholesale markets, it was about consistency and prioritizing the wholesale market and not just using it as a dumping ground, not just using the local grocery store as a dumping ground when we have access having it every week so they can have what they want. Their produce managers want a consistent product that's there every week that their customers are going to know is there. Like Hellman's mayonnaise is on the shelf every week, yep. 20, you know, as long, and we can't provide it all year round, but we do it over a long season. And when we could sell our greens at a much higher price in March, we still give them to the grocery store so they can have them over a longer season, mm-hmm. even though we could get a higher price elsewhere when they're kind of scarce around Vermont. So that, that was kind of our, we just chose to prioritize that market. And I think branding ourselves made a big difference for us. It's just, um, we were struggling being in the middle of nowhere for, you know, to have people know us and figure out who we were since we, you know, people weren't coming on farm very often. Um, and so we got a, a great logo done by a local artist, Mary Zarian. And, um, it really did help capture, I think who we are and sort of, you know, we're much more recognized now and, um, yeah, that's helped us a lot. While we're talking about, um, markets, marketing, is there anything else that you'd like to highlight about that? We all need to find a solution to the plastic bag <laughs> <laughs> and none of where that's something that we, we would like to make a large, the clamshell, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. We'd love to move to the clamshell, which yeah. we did for a while, the biodegradable compostable clamshell, but, um, in the end, I think, uh, with the amount of greens and produce that we bag here, um, it's some, something that we're pushing co-ops and, and other folks to sort of all, you know, seek out a, a better, a better option for everyone. Um, it, and I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's going to come. I think the challenge with it is we've, we've bought in really expensive, like plant-based compostable things and the customer's you know, there's no difference in sales. There may be some customers who care, but, um, it just, you know, basically just puts us at a market disadvantage. Um, even though the rest of our lives are spent like so focused on environmental sustainability and how we farm and, and, um, and so it was just hard, like, Oh, well, one more thing that we're at a disadvantage at, um, is paying 60 cents as opposed to three cents per packaging container. Um, and it's something we want to do. We're just trying, we've been talking with the co-ops and stuff of just coming up with some uniform. There is no good biodegradable plastic bag out there, but there's better. And I think, um, having stores in communities just decide this is a container that all the different farm salad greens are going to go in. It's going to be more expensive for everybody, but everybody's on the playing field. So if you're selling greens at this co-op, it's got to be in this level of plant-based compostable bag, which we know most people are going to throw away, but it's still in the end, a little bit better than a regular plastic bag. Kind of raising the bar yeah. at the store yeah. level. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just creating some uniformity. So it's not the people who are already doing the most having to then spend more Yep. Um, just making it the norm. Yeah, just making it the norm, and and I think that's how all this has to happen is this incremental change. And where in any there's there isn't a good product out there where someone can say this is amazing. And it's like yeah, they all have their problems, but I feel a lot of the plant based ones are just better. You know, I think in the end, you weigh everything out. It in at the bare minimum, they're moving that economy in the right direction away from petroleum. I think, um, yeah, I think something else about our marketing is, is with, we sell microgreens and we sell greens. And, um, I think we've always tried to have like a versatile product line that overlaps so that we've always, we always sell everything every week. If we have a little extra of this, it's going to go in this mix. We have a little extra of that, it's going to go in this mix. If we get huge orders for lettuce, there'll be none of that in our mescaline mix that week. 
Um, and so just keeping that versatility has been super important for us in terms of our financial success. Yeah, there's a ton of overlap in the microgreens as well. Um, and the micro salad, it's great. Yeah. I think over the years, probably we have sold produce at almost every little store, kind of just above a gas station, quick stop place in the area. Not all of them have worked, um, but that is really important. If you're farming in a rural area, you you know, the, everybody out there is eating food, but not everybody can go to the farmer's market and not everybody wants a CSA share. And um, if there aren't retail locations that are convenient for people, they're just not going to buy local food. So um, we just you have always just found those little places where stuff wasn't being sold and, and tried to make it work. And some of them have worked and we have some really small stores that are, you know, they're right on our delivery route and we'll drop off a hundred dollars worth of stuff every week. And that adds up over the season. They're super easy, consistent clients. Um, and they're just tiny little stores, um, that are in towns that aren't big enough to have a supermarket, but they can have a little bigger than a gas station. And that's kind of what it's like up here in the Northeast kingdom. There's a bunch of stores like that. Um, so I think that's just an important thing for, you know, our success, um, was just, spending that time and it, it was a lot of energy and effort of like having them not order much for a long and just maybe dropping off six bags of greens or four bags of greens at a store but you just slowly build a market and then all of a sudden you have a consistent market for you know we can sell about we were moving about 250 pounds a week throughout the whole season and we always have a place for it to go and we kind of know how much we can sell and that really adds up to some great income for the farm is just to have that consistent and even though we have to go to a bunch of different little stores to sell it um it's it's good and it's good for the community too because when they stop at that just above a gas station type store there's some like healthy local salad greens for them that were cut that day yeah um, you bring up a good point. Uh, how did you stay motivated to be persistent to keep dropping off these f four bags of greens at this tiny little store on your way to town? Like, that's an effort where you're like, you know, I'm not paying for myself to do this. What? Mm. And obviously, you built a relationship, and now that leads into more consistent sales. It makes it worth your time to stop. But how do you stay motivated uh, over the years while you're Survival. starting? That? <laughs> Yeah. I think survival in the beginning, in the very beginning. Yeah, we needed that $20. Yeah, every yeah. little bit, we kind of scraped it all together to make a farm, and then it and then it really took off. So. And, and, and we know where we live. Like, the you know, the, the average income up here is pretty low in the Northeast Kingdom, and, um, you know, but the quality of life is amazing, and, and all of our neighbors make compromise on what they're going to make and how much effort they have to put in to make that money. Yeah. Um, there's very few people up here who don't, but um, it's great to live in a place where that's a value. People are like, oh, yep, less money, but better life is worth it. Um, so, yeah, it was what all of, you know, there's, you know, like in, you know, in, in rural Vermont, everybody's got four or five jobs. And that was just an extra little part of our five jobs was to drop off these small amounts. And also just knowing that from the beginning, like we didn't want to grow our CSA shares. We didn't want to, farmer's market was impractical because we didn't have a cooler and we didn't really want to be, there are a lot of farms locally. We, we wanted to try as to, to grow the market, not not just compete for the same market with the, with our local farmers who are friends and neighbors. Um, so we just kind of played the long game with that, with kind of marketing the more wholesale type greens to the stores. Um, and now it really pays off because we can move a lot every week and, and it's, it's, it's the most profitable crop for us and it is for a lot of farms. Um, but the more you move, the more profitable it becomes because, um, you know, it doesn't take that much longer to wash an extra 20 pounds of greens. Um, you know, when you got every your whole system set up, did you have your logo and brand developed early on? So have you been building your brand that whole time? I'm trying to think Gosh, was it probably seven or eight years yeah, ago. It was a while yeah. Ago. Um, so we probably we tried, we tried, selling the greens without a logo for nobody had a logo really yeah there was no farms in the area that were they labeling their greens at the co-ops yeah so we started at the littleton co-op where we sell which is a great a great co-op that was pretty young then and and we 
we put a label on our bags there because it was already a pretty good market and they the produce people are like if you put a label on it like it'll sell better and we're <laughs> like all right we're, we'll we'll work on that and then it all miraculously happened and um and man they flew i mean it really made yeah it tripled our sales yeah. like right away just yep. that's know. awesome yeah yep. um and and this is kind of old news now like everybody always labels their greens except at like farmers markets now for the most part but um so yeah, it was really slow going before we did that at all those little places, you know, it just didn't work. And especially for the supermarkets, like there's gotta be a label on it. There's gotta be a way to differentiate it. And so that helped us to then work into the smaller local supermarkets and little stores. And we got pretty creative with marketing. Um, again, just trying to find little niches and little ways to be creative to sell food. Um, we came up with some French fry boxes that we hmm. would put our snacking cu- cu- cucumbers upright in with a little circular <sighs> label that said snacking cukes. You know, we just thought people would love that for their kids in their grocery yep. cart and um, just hand it to them and they can just munch on them. And um, those sold great. And so we we have put a lot of energy into um, just how our products leave the farm and how they're going to look in the store as far as packaging and, and labels and colors. And yeah, we've put a lot of energy into it and I feel like it's really paid off. And for every success you have with that, there's like three or four things that didn't work out that you <laughs> tried and, yeah. and just being willing to do that. And, and, um, you know, not like, you know, it's, it's pretty hard these days when you look, since there's a lot of ways to get access to what, what successful farms are making. And you're like, oh my God, like, how am I ever going to make that my farm? Well, you're not like the first year, <laughs> maybe you are, but, um, you know, most of those farms who are making good incomes. Most of them, unless they're in, have really great high value markets or in a metropolitan area, um, they had to build a market over years and years. And the more rural you are, the more years it's going to take to build that market, you know, and just, we kind of knew that and just took the time in the beginning. Kept our needs low. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, the majority of the United States is rural. So yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, there's a lot of farms that yeah. are thinking and marketing to places much like you are. So absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and also like we could have grown a lot faster. We just didn't choose to in the beginning. It wasn't part of our kind of plan, you know, <laughs> in the beginning. And then, and then once it was, then we, we were pretty happy with the growth rate from there. I liked how you said how you're uh, path people rather than goal people. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So thanks for sharing a little bit about uh, your marketing and your story a little, and uh, how you're selling your stuff out here in rural Vermont. Appreciate it. You bet. Thank you. If people want to reach out with questions uh, or follow along with what you're doing, how can they get a hold of you? Well, we have an Instagram page, um, Small Axe Farm. And we have a Facebook page and we have a website, which is just smallxfarm.com. Sounds good. Well, thanks for being on the show and I hope you have a great day. Thanks. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you learned something today or plan to make a change on your farm, let me know. I'd love to receive any feedback you have. Just click the link in the description to submit the form. It will help the future of this podcast to be a resource that is helpful for you. And while you're at it, I hope you go ahead and subscribe, share this with a friend, or leave a comment. And if you want more information, check out the show notes on our website at agengpodcast.com. That's A-G-E-N-G-P-O-D-C-A-S-T dot com. Thanks for listening, and I hope you have a great day. The proceeding has been a production of University of Vermont Extension. For more information on Extension, log on to www.uvm.edu extension.